much of what we do as practitioners is to prevent inadvertent security problems, oversights, zero days, etc. What about inherent and unavoidable problems when the very design of the thing requires a lack of security? What do you do then? You're listening to Defense in Depth. Welcome to Defense in Depth. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series. Joining me as always is Alan Alford. Alan, everyone loves that that opening sound of your voice, so let's hear it. Howdy, y'all. There you go. You know he's a Texan. We're available at CISOseries.com. We are on the subreddit of uh, CISO series. By the way, if you follow the cybersecurity subreddit, every Friday I am dropping the best or the most important, interesting five cybersecurity stories of the week as told on Cybersecurity Headlines, which is our daily show, six minutes every weekday at 6 a.m. Eastern. Please register for that and register for our weekly video chats. The one tomorrow, if you're listening to this on the day it was dropped, the 17th, the one tomorrow is our last one of the entire year 2020. And this is our last episode of 2020. So go to CISOseries.com, click on register for video chats to join us, and that'll be Hacking the Crown Jewels. All right. Our sponsor for today's episode, Alan, is F5. They have been an awesome sponsor. In fact, they've also sponsored one of our video chats as well. And they are responsible for bringing our sponsored guests today. Set us up. What are we going to be talking about? We're going to be talking about intentionally vulnerable by design. What does that mean? Yeah, so I gave a couple of examples in my post. I was thinking through all of those moments where you sort of have to compromise security intentionally. And the best one I could think of was a password reset page. You're straight off the bat with a password reset page, basically saying, we've got a compromised security state here. We're going to go through a somewhat sketchy process and get you back to rights. And then in theory, it's you and it's your new password and everything is back to rights. But there's some risk there at that moment. Loyalty programs where the passwords are non-existent or they're simple or they're retrievable. Anything else where identity is basically loosely established. All of those little moments, I asked, what are we doing about these? How do we deal with these? Because it's the weak link. I didn't mention it in my post, but in the video game industry, online video game realms, you know, Steam and Battle.net and all these guys, every time you hear about a good hack, the hack was almost always by way of the password reset function. Yes. And by the way, that is just some examples. Some are more very just basically concrete, like, We have to accept credit cards to make business and getting that information and trying to secure it is just the mechanism we need to run business. Anyway, the person that's going to help us walk through this discussion is from F5. It is Dan Woods, VP of the Shape Intelligence Center. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. What's the situation? Jason Dance of Greenwich Associates said, anything that requires you to identify a specific person should require secure validation. Seems pretty basic, kind of what you were referencing, Alan. And Duncan Hart of Cyber Risk Quant said, quote, one of those trade-offs is deciding how many security incidents is the right number of incidents for your business. That number can't be unbounded and it can't be zero either, as zero probably means you've overspent on protection. And lastly, Jonathan Waldrop of Insight Global said, quote, we don't protect everything as strictly as our closest held secrets that's too expensive to maintain. Like what Duncan said, we find balance. Having a car stolen is a terrible thing, but a hundred years of a car driving and we still have one lock and one key. We don't need biometrics, passwords, and how fast do you accelerate to judge if you're authorized driver or not? Now, I I would question Jonathan's comment because there are some alternative ways to open up a car. Alan, they are just talking about identity, but also finding what is that balance of you need, you know, inherently you're going to have some insecurity. How much do you handle? Yeah, this is risk appetite. That's all we're talking about here is risk appetite. And Duncan and Jonathan are spot on. You you don't want to secure all the things, right? Despite the memes, secure all the things. You've obviously got to strike a balance. If you spend way too much money to hit every single corner case and every nook and cranny, you're going to drive your business under underground. So I I think risk appetite is a key component to this conversation. I think that should be there. And to Jason's point, identity for me is is absolutely critical to this whole process as well, especially when we start to talk about these these moments when things are getting a little dicier, things are getting a little riskier. It's all about identity. And so I I think risk appetite and identity kind of are the, the bookends for this conversation. All right. 
Dan, do me a favor. Are we thinking about this subject broad enough in that should we only be focused on identity or should we be looking broader? Definitely much more broadly. Uh, A couple of the inherent vulnerabilities I heard mentioned so far are indeed inherent vulnerabilities, but we've missed the main one, and that is uh, the login application. For an enterprise to be able to allow their customers to create accounts, log into those accounts, of course, uh, reset passwords, maybe add a credit card, do all sorts of things, they need to have a public-facing login application. And that by itself makes them vulnerable to credential stuffing attacks, where a bad actor is just going to try millions, even billions of username password pairs against the login application. And because of the way people reuse their passwords, we're seeing these credential stuffing attacks result in account takeover anywhere from 0.1 to 3% of the time. So that is the primary uh, inherent vulnerability. Hold it, wait. 0.1 to 3% of all logins are credential stuffing attacks? No, actually, we've seen 99% of all logins be credential stuffing attacks at many enterprises. So luckily, we're blocking a lot of them. So so what's the 0.1 to 3%? That is the login success rate of the attacker. Ah, so yeah, that's so, a little too high. 0.1 yeah. is too high. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very high. When you're trying hundreds of millions or even billions of username password pairs and you have a 0.1 to 3% login success rate, you're compromising a lot of accounts. And so now your defense in depth situation that must go into overdrive at that point. But I think what I like which the way you presented this is you you got to I'm going to I'm going to give you crap here, Alan. You went far too far in the weeds to begin with. Dan here is pointing out that The just basics one needs to operate a business online makes you inherently vulnerable. I mean, that's really the headline here, right? Yeah, that initial that initial login page. I hadn't thought about that one, but that's that's exactly right, because password reset is adjunct to that. That initial login, create the account, go through the exercise and do the initial. That's absolutely it has to be there. It may be MFA, it may not, but it has to be there. And it's definitely an attack surface. And we've even noticed that MFA doesn't always stop credential stuffing. It certainly makes ATO harder, but most implementations of MFA, if you enter in the incorrect password, you're told incorrect password or username. If you enter in the correct username or password, then and only then are you asked for your second factor of authentication. So that tells the attacker the information that he's seeking is a username and password correct. Admittedly, ATO is harder with multi-factor authentication. It is. But there are many techniques to get around, especially text-based and email-based MFA, which I suppose we're going to be talking more about during this conversation. If you looked at the problem this way... David Thomas of Computer Center said, bring truly contextual aware identity and access management to the party. Forget two-factor. To authenticate a user or system, we must use multiple data points to establish the correct level of trust. And Jason Dance, again, of Greenwich Associates said, I posit that the current design of push-based MFA does not have enough information for the recipient to determine what they are approving. How powerful would it be if your push notification said, did you trigger this action, password reset on this website at this time and date? And then have yes, no buttons, which, by the way, I get that kind of stuff from my credit card company. Dan, this is essentially sort of an automated or AI or intelligent aware MFA rather than the human MFA. Yes? Is that the way to see it? Contextual MFA. Yeah. Well, both David and Jason are thinking about this in precisely the right way. David talking about contextual awareness. We're not just limited to, is the username and password correct? If so, then we allow it. At Shape F5, we have what we call continuous authentication. We're looking at how that client does, say, floating point math or a lot of other signals within the client environment. And that, in addition to the username and password, will tell us whether or not it's a legitimate login. Because we're finding bad actors have the correct username and password. So we need to identify them as bad actors using other contextual uh, you know, signals. Besides the ones given here, what are some other contextual signals? And actually, what are the ones that are most telling, I think? 
Well, when you start collecting, you know, behavioral biometrics, think about the way you enter in your password. Over the time, you develop a rhythm entering in your password. A bad actor can certainly type in the correct password, but there's no way he's going to match the rhythm that you have when you type in your password. So when you collect all these signals and have the AI and ML systems just analyzing all these signals, looking for those sorts of anomalies, that's when it could fire it off an alert for a human to uh, do manual inspection. Alan, what about you? What other contextual signals have you seen that works well? This is a good conversation. Context is the right word here. That word always gets me excited because I've, I've worked with a variety of systems over the years and different different methods and means. And, and a lot of this stuff was roll your own you know, within the confines of my shop. In other words, I didn't have off-the-shelf solutions I could go buy that were doing what I needed done. So I was having to run around scurrying to cross-reference things. But some basic stuff, like cross-referencing your badging system to your login. You know, David normally logs into his California office every Monday, roughly between 7 and 8 a.m. And suddenly he's logged in at 3 a.m. in China. Um, And it's the same username and password, but it's coming from a whole different place. Like, there's a red flag. Things like that, right? Where do you log in from? When do you log in from? And that's a pretty easy example of that. I mean, I think if you add them up, like sometimes I don't enter my password with the same rhythm every time. I don't want to be locked out for that matter. But if you were to add it to other stuff, Dan, like I'm not doing the same rhythm, I'm doing it at an odd time. You know, again, sometimes I wake up at three in the morning to work. Like if if multiple things are added together, that's when it sort of triggers something. And that is the key. It's not one signal. It's got to be the totality of the signals. Otherwise, you don't have full context. So in the in the beginning, prior to Shape being acquired by a five, you know, we were a stateless service, meaning we looked at the signals in the transaction and nothing more. So we 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 couldn't look at the history of logins. Like, is it unusual for this person to log in from this region of the world? But since then, uh, we've developed additional capabilities to be stateful. So now we have full view of the context of the user. We really know the user well. So when they log in, we can make a really well-informed decision as to whether or not they are a good person or a bad person. All right, let me challenge just one quick and quick response to this one. What happens when you make a mistake? Let's say I did wake up at three in the morning. I typed in my password, not with the normal rhythm because I'm groggy. And maybe there's some of and you, all those signals, you lock me out. How do I get back in and how is this handled at this point? Yeah, typically, if the totality of the signals still makes it questionable, like it's still possible, it's the legitimate user, we don't typically mitigate. We'll just flag and pass to origin. Then origin can make a decision on what to do. But when we're certain, like this is coming from IP address that we know is associated with a bad actor because we see him launching attacks across the entire ship network, then we'll take a more aggressive action. How are the vendors handling this? John Michael Amblett said, quote, on the password side, I would flip the accountability to the vendors. Indeed, I believe vendors should be providing discounts to customers that are using longer passwords and enable 2FA. I I was saying that uh, MailChimp does this. I know this. And Dutch Schwartz of AWS uh, spoke about loyalty programs. He said, quote, they aren't inherently risky. They incur risk because users prefer it that way. User behavior dictates the lack of security. It's an interesting take. So what will they get if they hack into my loyalty program? Eh, I think the answer is on the user side because they are creating the risk. Everyone should be taught to have a poison taster. You should have a wholly digital identity that ties to nothing or as close to nothing as possible in the real world. So two very interesting takes. One is John Michael saying, this is the vendor's problem. They should deal with this in terms of multiple of these issues. And Dutch is saying, in some cases, people really hold their identities very loosely. Alan? It really depends on the scenario involved, right? When we talk about vendors, are we talking about vendors with consumers, right? Consumer physics is always different than, than B2B or any of those kinds of physics, right? So I, I think in terms of the loyalty programs example, Dutch is right. It's, it's on the individuals themselves. At risk, if my loyalty account gets compromised, what's at risk is my stuff, right? 
I've got a credit card on file or I've saved up, you know, a hundred points of, you know, Acme cash. And, and now my Acme account gets hacked and somebody spends my Acme cash. It's generally on me. Now, now the, the vendor in that case is probably going to have to do some reimbursement. They've got a stake in the game, but, but it's really more my risk as the consumer. So I'm with Dutch's perspective there, but to uh, Jean-Michael's comment about the, uh, the passwords and enabling the 2FA, I think this is dynamite. I, I love this idea. I've got probably five banks that I work with, uh, you know, for various over the years, loan from here, loan from there, get the lowest rate, sign up with a new bank. And I have one bank who still doesn't offer MFA of any sort whatsoever. Nothing, not even an SMS text message, no MFA. And I refuse to have any money in there other than the $5 savings account required to keep the bank alive. And, you know, and the one loan that I'm rapidly paying off. So I'm with that idea as well. I want the vendors to take more responsibility, to have more encouragement, to build ecosystems that make it better. Yes, it's mostly on the user, especially in the consumer world, but, but the vendor has a play in that, has a role in that. And that's where, the, that's where the activity and effort are centralized. So why not have the security and protections there? All right, Dan, I love the idea of providing discounts. And the thing is, we see discounts to customers for taking positive actions and a positive action of a longer password, 2FA, unique password, whatever it is, would actually save the company money if the individual was more aware of their own security. So this would be like, you know, win-win for everybody. Why don't we see more of this? And do we see more of this? And are there other examples? Yeah, I love that idea as well. And we, we do see it in, say, auto insurance. You know, they'll give you a device, you put it in your car, or maybe an app on your phone. And uh, you get a discount on your insurance if you are driving safely. So we are seeing these sorts of things, but I haven't seen anybody offer me a discount for using a strong username and password. Uh, I think it's a great idea. On on Dutch's point, I, I need to kind of become a little a little bit more general. Uh, he's talking about specifically ATO into a loyalty account. But that's not the only type of uh, abuse we see on loyalty accounts. So for example, if... You have an account that has some asset, maybe frequent flyer miles or loyalty reward points at some hotel, and the hotel or the airline allow you to move those assets between accounts. And they'll do that oftentimes when for, to, to help families manage their loyalty points. If they allow that, then you're going to see criminal organizations use automation to create tens of thousands of those accounts and then use it for money laundering. So it isn't just about taking over a victim's account. It's abusing the loyalty program in such a way that it is, uh, you know, criminal. And money laundering, of course, falls into that category. And we've seen that also, like, with, like, AWS instances where people, like, abuse people's AWS accounts to just run processing off it or use, what am I saying, using other people's computers as botnets, for that matter. I mean, we see abuse of other networks, not direct stealing of money, but just using it as sort of a, a mechanism to to a greater end. Yeah, we, we see a lot of automated attacks using AWS and other uh, you know, hosting providers. Nothing will happen until we take action. Victor G of Growth 2K Enterprises said, quote, it all boils down to comprehensive identity management protocols. Without it, everything is game, which... That kind of sums up a lot of things we just said. And Cameron Holser of IBM said, quote, one piece of the password reset process that I feel gets taken for granted is having access to the email account that receives the link. Email accounts were never intentionally designed to be robust proof of identity. Let me, I'm going to start with you, Dan, on this one. Is it just a giant mistake to be doing identity through email? And so much gets authenticated through email. Yeah, it is through email and through these SMS text messages. There are lots of ways to compromise those accounts. In fact, we have many, many telco customers, and we also have many of these providers of email. And they see, without fail, 80 to 95% automated attack against their login application. That's, that's pretty consistent. And it's because these bad actors are targeting those telcos and those email providers to get access to the second factor of authentication or to those critically important password reset notifications. So we are uh, crazy to put all of our eggs in the email or SMS basket. Absolutely. Let me just generally ask you, you've referenced, you know, the, the research and what you see at shape. Would the rest of the public be scared S-less, if you will, 
if we knew what you know right now? Yes, uh, it's it's true. Look, I used to uh, I used to be a CIA cyber operations officer. I was an FBI agent. I've seen a lot of uh, incredible things, but when I got to shape and started to see the the size and scope and volume of the attacks against uh, virtually every public facing web and mobile application, it was jaw dropping for me. Just jaw dropping, and we see it regularly now. We go in line, look at traffic. And it isn't uncommon for us to see 80. We've actually seen 99.99% of all login traffic was attack traffic. I know it's hard to believe. That's but insane. We see insane. That's interesting. There's that much automated insanity going on and everything else is physical humans. So what you have is a crazy multiple of all the humans that are online doing that. And I have to admit, the, the implications of 99% automated attack traffic, they're profound. It isn't just about ATO. You, don't, you have no idea if your marketing dollars are being well spent. Television commercials, email campaigns, they have no measurable impact on the human traffic uh, among the noise of the attack traffic. Think about latency and server performance. Uh, some fraud tools charge per transaction. Some CDNs charge per transaction. So 99% automated attack traffic it's profound, uh, the implication and the cost. Very good point. Alan, I'm going to throw this to you. Let's going back to the, uh, the email discussion. I actually just found a new service that I'm using where there's no username and password. Everything is authenticated through email. So you give them your email address at the beginning, they send you a one-time password, and then they have authenticated your system. If you see you go into another system and you try to go on, they'll send you another one-time password. So every time you try to get on, it's a one-time password sent to your email. This seems really easy to break, is it? Yeah, it seems easy to break to me for sure. <laughs> That's a little frightening. And I'm assuming there's a token issued on a per-device basis. So yes. if you stay on the same yeah. device, you're running off a token, and at some point right. that resets. Multiple but... times I go back, you know, like it's a cookie or something. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. But any kind of email or SMS as the crux of the matter, anything where the entire identity is hinging on one of those two is bad, 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 bad. Have complex passwords, randomly generate them, you know, modify them, lengthen them, make them as horrible and painful as they can be. Keep them in a password vault, change them frequently, change them often, use identity and access management every place you can. And then to Dan's point, context is king from there, right? You've got to have strong context to better understand what's going on. And if you're the consumer talking about doing these things with your bank, with your department store, I know it's, you know, holiday season right now, people are shopping like crazy. I just this morning, in fact, this true story Open my email to click on check the status of my purchase, and it took me to an error page on the company's website. It was a particular department store. I then had to do the password recovery mechanism with them. I got logged in, and it said, greetings, Dohan. I wasn't Alan. I was Dohan. <laughs> um, so, so clearly relying strictly upon email, you know, something squirrely went wrong. I'm going to assume that one was an innocent, that it was just a screw up in the database. But this idea that email equals identity is, is an atrocious idea to me. Well, closing on atrocious ideas, let's, <laughs> let's take to our, our best, our favorite quotes from, the, uh, from this discussion today. I'll begin with you, Alan. I always ask you first, what was your favorite quote and why? I like Victor G from Growth 2K Enterprises, um, basically saying comprehensive uh, identity management has got to be there. I, I think that's absolutely right. I think I think that's the core of it and the beginning of it. Let's get strong identity. And then from there, let's get context and let's let's knock this thing out of the park. All right. I'll throw this now to you, Dan. Which one was your favorite one? Well, I probably won't pronounce his name properly, but John Michael Amblot. I love the idea of offering discounts to incentivize people to use really strong passwords. Yeah, I like that idea. I haven't seen that either. MFA I have seen because I, I see it with uh, MailChimp. But again, it just like you said, with the insurance industry does this, it's a total win-win for everybody. We have seen the complete opposite that drives everyone crazy where the, the companies that charge, if you want to add single sign-on, they charge for that service additionally, which seems antithetical, if you will. But yeah, excellent point. All right, I want to thank Dan Woods our sponsored guest, for, who is the VP of the Shape Intelligence Center over at F5. For joining us, I will let you have the last word, Dan. Hold tight on that. And I want to thank F5 for sponsoring this very, very show. Thank you very much. And for bringing Dan. Dan, you were amazing. By the way, just the insight of what you had to say about 
what you see over at Shape, I found pretty fascinating. Alan, any last words? 99% equals a tax. I'm scared and I want to go home. <laughs> You're already home, Alan. <laughs> We're all already home. <laughs> No, that's good stuff. I, I had no idea it was that big. It was that bad. I, I absolutely appreciate the context-based approach. Let's figure out who people really are. Let's follow their behaviors and patterns and, and isolate and be able to identify. I think it's absolutely the right approach to head down that path of context and identity. So well done. I said, and Dan, any last words, anything you want to plug with F5? Please, please let us know. Well, I'm not in sales, so I'm just going to uh, keep it simple and say, the first step in dealing with these sorts of attacks is gaining visibility. And uh, Shape and F5, we can help you with gaining visibility very painlessly. We could help you identify which web and mobile applications are seeing the most amount of unwanted automation. And then once you have that visibility, then you can make well-informed decisions on the path forward. So if you think you don't have 99% abuse going on, probably you need that visibility. All right, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you very much, Alan. And as I say to our audience all the time, and this has been so critical here especially, thank you for your contributions. Many of them I know are unwitting, but we appreciate your contributions. Really, you're just contributing to the cybersecurity community in general, and we're taking advantage of it. So thank you very much, and thank you for listening to Defense In Depth. We've reached the end of Defense In Depth. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss yet another hot topic in cybersecurity. This show thrives on your contributions. Please write a review, leave a comment on LinkedIn, or on our site, CISOseries.com, where you'll also see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or a comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at david at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to Defense In Depth.